The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, I think we're ready to begin our webinar. Welcome everyone to this month's webinar, which is HyPot 102. This is the second of a two-part series that we have. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, AC versus DC testing, uh, some of the leakage current limits and, and how you uh, find those values, 500 VA HyPot testing, what that means, if, if you should be worried about that, um, some of our fault detection systems, and our features that are designed to uh, help with uh, AC and DC uh, issues that you may run into. But before we begin, let me introduce you to our team here. My name is Anthony. I'm an applications engineer here with Iconics USA. Uh, I'll be your presenter. My colleague Bishan Patel will be the panelist, so he will he'll he'll be taking care of the Q and A utility. So if there's any questions you have during this presentation, feel free to ask. If he if he deems it um, you know a good question, he'll chime in and we can discuss it as a group. And Brittany Soha is our organizer today. So as I said, please use our Q and A utility if you have any uh, questions or concerns. Um, this webinar is being recorded as all our webinars are being recorded. So if you missed uh, HyPot Testing 101, you can uh, reach out to Brittany. She can uh, send you a link where you can view that and also you can get the presentation. Um, currently, if you're having any issues, you know, logging in or seeing me or hearing me, feel free to reach out to Brittany and she'll try to take care of you as quick as possible. Um, a couple things I did want to add since there is uh, the new GDPR that has been, uh, companies have been updating lately. We are now limited to who we can send um, our notifications for webinars and whatnot. So if you're not subscribed to our event emails, um, you won't be getting these. So uh, you, if you'd like to subscribe, um, you can reach out to Brittany and she can take care of that as well. Um, also, Bashan and I last month were at the IEEE uh, PSCS uh, presented a paper on medical device testing so and we were able to meet a lot of uh, attendees and, and they let us know that um, these webinars are being viewed and they, they appreciate they find the value and in the information we're giving so that was good to hear um, you know gives us some extra vigor to make sure we're, we're still presenting these and, and adding new content every year now let's talk about today's webinar HyPot testing 102 um, what we'll be discussing today, AC versus DC testing, right? Both of those have different characteristics when it comes to reactive versus real current, and <clears throat> what are the pros and cons of each respective test, and if you should be doing one over the, one over the other. 500 VA HIPAA testing, uh, due to some of those characteristics of AC and DC, some people are forced to do 500 VA HIPAA testing. Um, we'll talk about what it is and line versus load regulation. That also comes into play if you should be uh, using a bigger tester. And again, due to those characteristics of AC versus DC, you might run into issues with false failures and whatnot. And to combat that, you know, manufacturers um, should be creating these features like um, associated research has to help get past those uh, reactive current or false failures. Um, so there's a lot of content in this webinar, so let's uh, jump right into it. But first, let's just, um, this is HyPot testing webinar, right? So let's talk about what a HyPot test is. Um, the dielectric voltage withstand test, or the HyPot test, which stands for high potential, is designed to stress the insulation of your product far beyond what it will encounter during normal use. Now, the assumption is that if you can, if your insulation can withstand the significantly higher voltage for a given time, it will be able to function adequately at its normal level, level whether it be you know 120 volts or 240. Um, thus, the term voltage withstand test. So, if you're quickly searching through a standard, you know voltage withstand test. Um, over voltage test, dielectric withstand test, these are the terms you'd be searching for. Um, how to hook up a HyPot test. Normally, um, you would be using the line and neutral shorted together. This is where we apply high voltage 
and return, returning on some dead metal or on an access point to the ground circuit. Um, and you'll apply the high voltage, the electric field, across that insulation, and we'll see if we can find any excessive leakage current, um, weak or damaged insulation. Uh, it's good for finding you know, foreign particles or, or trapped particles that may have found its way uh, through your production process. Um, also spacing and uh, wiring error. So, so the high pot test is, is just a good test to perform to make sure that the quality of your production is being maintained. <clears throat> now, AC versus DC high pot testing. Depending on the product being tested and the test standard, the high pot test can either be performed using AC or DC potential. Now, each of those means something different, right? Because when it comes to AC, this is where we're introducing um, reactive current throughout the entire dwell process of the test where DC, you're only seeing real current. And these are kind of some insights into the advantages and disadvantages of using one or the other, which we'll discuss <clears throat> in the upcoming slides. And it's important to understand the differences because these can lead to, to false failures. They can lead to longer test times, which now backs up production. And um, associated research has created these features to, as I said, help combat uh, these issues you might run into due to the either characteristics of just AC versus DC voltage or the fact that your product may have some characteristics um, as in high capacitance, um, which could cause uh, delays in your testing or false failures. Now, what do you get with AC testing, right? You have, as you can see, you're testing in both polarities and you're also uh, getting that peak voltage when you're testing, right? Um, most standards will allow for either, but there is very variation in voltage. Uh, so as I said, right, AC, you're gonna be able to test in both polarities and you kind of get to test a little bit higher voltage momentarily right when that sinusoidal wave reaches the peak um, but you're also going to get constant reactive current throughout the test because with voltage changing in a short period of time, which is what AC voltage is doing, it's oscillating, you're constantly drawing that reactive current. Now with DC voltage, during the dwell of a test, right, when you're at your test voltage, well, you're fine. You There is no change in voltage, so any leakage you see will be real, but issues can occur during the ramp up, which we'll explore later. But I wanted to show you these excerpts here are taken from uh, straight out of standards and you can see where you have the choice right one minute AC test voltage um, for products that are operated at less than 150 volts 1350 is the voltage you should be testing at unless you're doing DC where you now you're stuck at 1900 volts um, right it's it's a, it's a higher voltage during your dwell time you're constantly exposed to that high voltage as opposed to AC where you're only seeing those peaks um, during the wave uh, when the period is at its peak. Um, this XR H17.1.2 voltage limiting clamping devices or line to ground filter capacitors um, are may be removed prior to test or the test may be conducted using a DC potential at 1.414 times the AC potential. So again, this language is directly out of a standard. Uh, this is taken into consideration and making exceptions for products which will have um, capacitive filters that are gonna draw excess current when performing a high pot test, which may look like a failure to your tester, but these can be removed prior to a test or you can uh, change to a DC potential at 1.414 times. Why is that number chosen? That's the square root of two, right? That's how you get from RMS to the peak voltage of an AC waveform. But as I said, the drawback is, well, if you were doing an AC hypothesis, you're only seeing that peak um, 
every 16 milliseconds, right? Every per wave, uh, depending on the frequency. Where on a DC test, well, now you're exposing it throughout the entire test. Um, but nonetheless, the, the basis of the high-pot test is Ohm's law, which governs, governs the relationship between current, voltage, and resistance. So the, the behavior of AC and DC current varies uh, in a resistive and a capacitive current. AC is bidirectional in nature, whereas DC current flows in one direction. So what's that mean? AC current being bidirectional means you're constantly, what's a high-pot test? I'm sorry, what's a high-pot test? It's, you're creating a, a capacitor. You are shorting your line in neutral, right? You can view it as one metal plate and you're connecting the return or the low side of that high pot test to a ground circuit, another metal plate with insulation in between. So you're just, every high pot test is inherently creating a capacitor. And what's a capacitor do? It stores charge. And with your AC current being bi-directional, well, you're just charging and discharging that capacitor, which is why you're always gonna see higher voltage, or I'm sorry, you're always gonna see higher leakage current in an AC test where the nature of DC current flows in one direction. So if you're performing uh, a DC high pot test um, on a capacitor or a highly capacitive product, right? Once one directional, once that capacitor is charged, current's gonna drop down to zero as we'll, we'll talk about in one of our next slides. Now, the differences in these two tests um, create, uh, different unique results when performing a high pot test. And one of those results uh, is related to our poll question right now, which is a bit unique, but we wanted to discuss like, now we know a high pot test can cause breakdown to your product's insulation, but can performing a high pot test on your product cause damage to the actual high pot tester? Right, I'm not asking if your high pot test can degrade your insulation or if it can somehow, you know, blow a, a cap you forgot to take out. Um, but can you cause damage to your high pot tester? Um, so we'll let Brittany open up the polls to see what um, our attendees think, and then we'll discuss those results. Hey, Tony, we had 27% of people say, no, not possible. You can't damage the high pot tester. 47% said yes, if not properly connected to the DUT. 13% said yes, even when properly connected to the DUT. And 13% of our attendees were not sure. Okay, so those are interesting results, right? 27% say no, you can't ever um, damage your hypot tester. So that's not true. There is times where we've had customer applications, they're doing nothing wrong, meaning they're not improperly connected to their uh, DUT, which stands for device under test, but actually performing a test correctly, connected properly, but still are somehow damaging their hypot tester. So this is where we segue into DC high pot testing <clears throat> and charging current. In a capacitive circuit, the AC and DC currents behave differently, right? When a DC potential is, apl is applied across a capacitor, a large amount of current is required to charge that capacitor. Now at the end of your test, where does that current go? We don't want it to remain on the product for the operator to either pick it up and move on to the next one and then get shocked. Um, instead, the high pot tester discharges it for you. Um, as the capacitor charges up with time, the current decreases and point comes where the capacitor is fully charged and no current flows, right? So what do you have to do? You have to discharge that. Now, your high pot testers can't handle as much charge as you can give it. We have a maximum 
a maximum capacitive load in DC mode. Now, this is a spec that's commonly overlooked by most of our customers. Um, because most of it, most of our customers, it doesn't apply to you. Uh, we guarantee to discharge your product um, in less than 100 milliseconds if you abide by these specs. And most products out there do abide by these specs. Now, the largest, um, I think, market where this would apply is in the in the cable and wire manufacturing market. You have spools of cables up to thousands of feet, and what have you done? You've you've spooled metal, uh, insulated, over and over on top of each other, creating this huge capacitor. And this is a spec <clears throat> that not a lot of uh, you know, product safety engineers or compliance engineers um, have off the top of their head. It's not something to, to consider, oh, how much capacitance, unintended capacitive coupling is in our product, right? This is something that <clears throat> you should be going to ask your design engineers uh, because if it's too much, the amount of charge that you're trying to discharge through the impedance of our output transformer may be too much to handle and now you've uh, burnt up a TVS or uh, somehow that charge has found its a different path through our return port and you've damaged your HyPot tester. So yes, it is possible for you to connect your product as you should, properly perform a HyPot test and still damage your tester. Now, are you out of luck if you happen to uh, be one of the customers that uh, has a highly capacitive product and this may be an issue. Well, the, there are steps you can take. Um, we don't have an out-of-the-box solution, but we do know that some customers have used, uh, you know, current limiting resistor in parallel with their test um, where that resistor can um, discharge current um, on top of our uh, tester. Um, but um, it, it becomes a bit tricky, and uh, that's what our applications team is here for, uh, to consult. Um, but some people, um, unfortunately, uh, keep, keep sending in their tester for repair, and um, they're testing correctly. It's just uh, they can't, you know, cut their spool of wire in half because someone just ordered 200, 2,000 feet of cable, and we need to test the insulation. Um, but uh, that was a good uh, webinar question because it seemed like a, a lot of people were under the impression that you could either only damage it by not properly connecting your product or none at all. So appreciate you participating in that. Now, going to the AC HyPot test, reactive current. When AC potential is applied across a resistor, the resulting leakage current is in phase with the applied voltage. When AC potential is applied across a capacitor, the resulting leakage current that flows is uh, 90 degrees out of phase with the applied voltage. This is the reactive current due to the capacitor. So an issue that comes up in AC testing is having a highly capacitive product and your HyPot tester, your HyPot tester's capability is limited. Right? Most testers can output about 20 milliamps of leakage current. Now, standards will say, you know, no breakdown shall occur. Well, most HyPod testers will tell you breakdown failure. And that can be a false fail, right? It just means that, hey, your, your product is so capacitive that it's drawing more than 20 milliamps. If you had a bigger tester maybe, one that can now put 100 milliamps, which we do carry, maybe you leak 21 milliamps. And guess what? Your insulation, there isn't a, ca a catastrophic breakdown, right? So you still pass your HyPot test. You might just be getting false failures due to the limitations of your product. Um, but there's some advantages to AC, right? You, you can do a quicker test because now we're not uh, ramping up and um, 
you know, trying to get past this huge spike of inrush reactive current. Um, but again, so there's uh, drawbacks to AC high-power tests and DC high-power tests, but there's also benefits. Um, there's ways around these um, issues that you arise, and these are some of the features that we'll talk about uh, coming up. So let's talk about total leakage current. We've just talked about DC resistive leakage and AC reactive leakage. The leakage current that is measured by most AC high-power testers is the vector sum of the resistive leakage current and the reactive leakage current. Some associated research high-power testers are capable of displaying real and total leakage currents for manufacturers who require extra information. So when performing a DC high-power test, that is all um, on a resistive load, right? Performing a DC high-power test on a resistive load, that is all real leakage. That is actual leakage that is flowing through your insulation. Now, performing a DC high-power test on a capacitive load, once you reach your test voltage, we're at the same place. Any leakage is purely resistive real leakage. Now, reactive current, on the other hand, how do you create reactive current? What is reactive current? Reactive current happens on a capacitive product when you have a large change of voltage in a short amount of time. Okay, so I'll say that again. When I'm ramping up my voltage in a short amount of time, I expect to see a bigger spike, a large amount of reactive current. So that's what a DC high pot test is, right? I'm going from zero to whatever my test voltage was really quickly. So even if there's a small bit of capacitance, I'm going to get a quick spike of reactive current, and then it's going to level off to zero because now I'm in my dwell time. There's no more change in voltage. All the leakage will be real leakage. Now our testers display both capacitive current and resistive current together, which we call total current. Most high-pot testers have uh, two meters, your total current and your real current which is another term for resistive current. Now, capacitive current and resistive current together is what we consider total current. Um, the high pot, um, the high pot test is more than just a go no go test. It can be used to find variations of insulation, right? And how do you do that? Well, we do that by creating a profile of what our products leak, right? Try to understand do we expect to leak this much reactive current, but our resistive current is zero, so on and so forth. We'll talk about how to, how to create a profile for your product um, in some of the upcoming slides. So let's, let's hammer this home with the AC high pot advantages and DC high pot advantages to just get a clear view of which you should be testing with. So AC high pot advantage, no ramping of voltage required due to the changing polarity of AC voltage, right? So for production, this is great. Um, most production tests require uh, one second of testing. So if I don't have to ramp up my voltage because AC is naturally ramping up by itself, well, now my production output is greater. Discharging the TUT is not necessary. Why? Because AC high pot uh, naturally discharges, right? Since it's constantly iso um, oscillating, but this isn't a universal uh, fact that you can just take. AC high pot discharging the DUT is not necessary. That's not true 100% of the time. Um, we've been on some consulting trips where we see customers who have their AC, when they're ready to test, they have their AC high pot tester constantly uh, outputting, right? So you can set your dwell to zero, which means this tester is just gonna constantly output. I now take my probes and if I have a huge line of products, just touch them, touch them, touch them, touch them. If, if there is a direct short, which is what most people are looking for, right? A direct short will cause a breakdown. Uh, then that's any, any small touch, uh, my high pot tester will give me a breakdown. But discharging the DUT is not necessary if your product is still connected to the tester when the test is over, meaning your high pot tester has had a chance to discharge or at least 
and the AC waveform at the zero crossing point. If, if you're touching probes on different parts of the product, well, you may happen to let go at the peak of that AC waveform, and now you might have to deal with uh, a charged product even though you're testing an AC. So it's an important note. Um, different applications might require more discharge or at least more methods of discharge. Um, the insulation is stressed in both polarities, right? I mean, um, the positive and negative polarity when you're testing an AC, which is good because, uh, you know, some insulations might uh, react differently uh, in different polarities. Now, it measures both real and reactive current. So, sure, it gives you more data on your product, right? How much leakage uh, real and reactive do I have? Um, now, that can also be viewed as a disadvantage, which we'll, we'll talk about disadvantages after this. And it's commonly accepted by safety agencies. Um, so, you're fine there. Now, what about some DC high pot advantages? You can be uh, a little bit more um, conservative because it can be confirmed at it can be performed at much lower current levels with less risk to the operator. So um, maybe not as much uh, uh, personal protective equipment or safety measures need to be taken. Um, it's often easier to perform on capacitive DUTs. Um, again, that's kind of a catch-22, which we'll talk about when I bring up disadvantages, but sure, once you reach your test voltage, it's that capacitive current that's needed is, has already been charged, and now you're, you're left with real current, and uh, that's why it's easier to perform on capacitive DUTs. The leakage current measurement is purely real. Um, again, right, that's more uh, of an opinion if you think that's what that's all you're looking for, which is true, right? If you're selling this product on the market um, and it's running, the real leakage is what uh, anyone who comes into contact with your product will be exposed to. So it's good to know that value, right? We want to keep it as low as possible. Um, it's cost effective, um, again, because um, your not what you're a DC high-pot test, there's less risk, risk to the operator, so you, you're, you're not worried about um, as much PPE and um, safety measures that might be needed with AC where you're constantly seeing a reactive current. If you're testing an AC, you're always going to have leakage values, and it's going to be uh, exponentially larger than DC leakage values. Um, but it's not always accepted by safety agencies because... Um, you know, sometimes they just don't have that, the standard might not have that multiplication factor for you, where it says if you can't perform an AC, you can do it at DC at 1.414. Not all uh, standards have been updated to include that type of language. Um, now, I can read this list back to you and point out what the disadvantages are, right? You are only testing in one polarity uh, in DC high pot, right? So that's kind of a disadvantage, right? You're not you're not getting both polarities, but at the same time, like that standard read earlier, take your AC high pot voltage and multiply it at for uh, by 1.414 square root of two, and that'll be your new test voltage. Well, that's your test voltage for the entire duration of your dwell time, as opposed to that same value in AC. You're only seeing it for the peaks right? With DC, well, you don't get that natural discharge like you do in AC. So that same wire manufacturer, I'm sorry, cable manufacturer that I spoke to earlier, they are testing spools of cable over and over and over, and the HIPAA tester cannot guarantee if you do not stay within those maximum loading specifications that I will leave you with an uncharged product. And so a lot of companies out there are forced to create their own uh, discharge methods, whether it be with um, what's called a hot stick sometimes, right, a discharge stick, Some, something as simple as um, a, a metal pole, obviously, with an insulated grip that you touch and the other end is touching ground, and now you just discharge to ground. Or um, 
a longer ramp down time, right? So a capacitor <clears throat> is going to be charged at whatever your voltage you're applying it to. So while I'm ramping up, yes, I'm constantly getting this huge spike of uh, charging current during DC. But it, as I'm ramping down, I'm also uh, discharging that capacitor. Now, that's a disadvantage because on both ends, you're going to have to increase your, your production time, right? You're going to have to uh, create uh, a longer ramp time to not get as much of that reactive current, to not get false failures. But at the same time, you're going to have to uh, cr have that same ramp down time to make sure you're discharging. So if you're doing DC high pot tests and you have a short uh, ramp down time, uh, you might want to consider checking if they're still charging your products, um, but also, if so, consider increasing your ramp down time. At the same time, if you find yourself getting false failures when running DC tests or getting immediate failures, well, that's because you're ramping up too quickly. And while your product uh, might not be very capacitive, such a large uh, ramping rate of voltage um, will create a huge spike, which may be more than your HyPot tester uh, can provide. Now, if you are testing with a, a, a short ramp, uh, short ramp uptime, and you are doing DC HyPot testing, and you have a capacitor product, and you're getting away with it, it's probably because you're using one of the features that we've created, which uh, I'll speak to uh, later. Now, if you're not, then one of the drawbacks is you might need uh, a 500 VA tester which can provide up to 900, uh, I wish, 100 milliamps of leakage current. That same can be said for AC high pot, right? If you have a capacitor product that's drawing, like I said, more than you know 20 milliamps, and you're constantly getting a uh, breakdown, so a breakdown is defined, a breakdown is only as real as how much current your high pot tester can provide. Right, there's some older analog testers that can provide three to five milliamps, and you're constantly going to get a failure every time. It doesn't mean that your insulation is bad. It doesn't mean that there's a, a hole in your insulation or that somehow uh, your ground is exposed to line. It just means that you have a capacitive product. You know, you have a leaky product, but if the transformer inside your high pot tester can could provide a bit more leakage, you'd pass because it's fine to leak current. Standards, obviously they're all different, but for the most part, they say no breakdown shall occur. Um, some of them say whatever your test voltage is, uh, hook up a 120 kilohm resistor and your tester should fail within one second. But even that is, uh, is a large amount of current. So it's important to realize that you can be getting false failures. I, I had a customer who, who just coincidentally, right, leaked around like 19 milliamps all the time. And it's such a, a sticky area to be in when your high pot tester can only provide 20 milliamps because uh, you're going to hit that 20 and you're going to get random failures that are false failures. It's just that you need to upgrade to a 500 VA tester, which is uh, what we'll discuss in the next coming slides. Um, other disadvantages, uh, I think we've covered them all. So that segues me into 500 VA high pot testing. So a VA rating, what is that? Certain standards require the use of a 500 VA high pot transfer. Well, VA is power. So uh, as anything, power is calculated by multiplying voltage and current. How much voltage can your high pot tester provide? Most of them are standard at 5,000 volts AC. So what's that mean? How much current? That's 100 milliamps. 100 milliamps times 5,000 volts, that gives you your 500 VA rating. Um, energy and breakdown. Originally, this was required to ensure high pot voltage output remained constant under varying line and load conditions. So back in the day, you would have these analog testers, and these analog testers would be uh, provided with specifications that were at uh, full scale, right? Full scale meaning, sure, if you're outputting 5,000 volts, this is your specification, this is your, your, your accuracy or your percent error, right? 
well, that doesn't really fly anymore because at 5,000 volts, <clears throat> sure, a, a 1% or a 2% uh, you know, deviation might not seem like a lot, but at that same value, right, 150 volts at a 1,000 volt test, well, now your auditor is going to say, well, you're testing at 850. You're, you're, that variance is way too much. And so that's why these 500 VA testers came into play. We need to be able to have enough juice in that transformer so that you're not dipping. The voltage isn't dipping due to uh, the load uh, varying and due to uh, certain input considerations, which we'll discuss further. But another reason why a 500 VA high-pot testers came into play is because of what we just discussed. Highly capacitive products started drawing way more than what these old analog testers can push out, and we're just failing everything. And so uh, we needed to create bigger, more powerful instruments to start seeing what the actual leakage was, right? Because if you're just constantly breaking down, are you and your high pot tester is limited at five milliamps, well, are you leaking six milliamps or 27 milliamps, right? Now with a 500 VA tester, you're, you're given the actual value. What's your leakage? Hey, maybe um, it's 60 milliamps. Well, guess what? I didn't break down though. There wasn't this catastrophic failure of insulation where a large inrush of current um, occurred in a short period of time um, to, to cause what's defined as a breakdown. Now, most associated research instruments have a 500 volt output. Um, thus, the instruments have a 100 milliamp trip current rating and a 200 milliamp short circuit current rating. So that short circuit current is comes out directly from standard, and it's not to be confused with, um, you know, what the high pot tester can output normally during the dwell of a test, right? Your tester doesn't need to output 200 milliamps. It's just, it's, it's a specification that when that transformer, uh, you know, the line and the neutral are shorted together, do you get a 200 milliamp spike, which um, is something that our engineering department has info on, and, and sometimes we've uh, put that in our specs. Um, we've started to leave it out now because most people recognize that the 100 milliamp is what they're looking for. Um, where the 200 milliamp is just short circuit, but there is confusion on that. Um, I would, here's 500 VA hypot testing by the standards. Now, I thought if you can indulge me for a second, I can pop up IEC 61010, which is for live equipment, right? And here is the section on the AC voltage test, right? So again, these standards have different terminologies for this hypot test. Here we're talking about uh, the AC voltage test. The generator shall be able to supply a power of at least 500 VA. The waveform of the power frequency test voltage shall, shall be substantially sinusoidal. This requirement is fulfilled if the ratio between the peak value and the RMS value is uh, 3%, right? But what we're looking at is the shells. Um, you know, something I, I recently learned is if your standard says shall, well, you need to abide by that. That's that's something that you need to follow. Everything behind that is a suggestion or or a way to point you in the right direction of what type of equipment you should be buying. This saying the waveform of the power frequency test voltage shall be. <clears throat> You know, the, the ratio between the, the peak value and the RMS should be square root of 2 plus or minus 3%, right? That's just what's the accuracy of your output. Plus or minus 3%, well, technically from a, from a test point, that can be perceived as like 6%, right? <clears throat> I believe uh, associated research uh, testers were accurate between 1% uh, with a few counts. And what's a count? That's just our minimum resolution, which is like 0.1 volts. Um, again, right, these testers aren't just built hoping we comply to these standards. We've used these standards to make sure that our specifications fall within everything that we're reading right here. Now, if we look at um, 
the DC voltage test. Oh, well, before I get there, no flashover of clearances or breakdown of solid insulation shall occur during the test. So this isn't telling me, hey, if you make lab equipment, you can't leak a certain value, right? Again, it's very general. It's telling you a breakdown shall not, shall not occur. So if you got, um, you know, someone who's new into the industry and they buy a used HyPot tester and they test their product and it's constantly saying breakdown, breakdown, breakdown. They don't understand what's going on. How is everyone else passing and I'm failing every test? Well, you bought a tester that can only supply you five milliamps and you have reactive current of six milliamps. It's just going to tell you breakdown, right? You need to um, understand that the technological advances in HyPot testing is for a reason. It's not just to make them look pretty, right? We understand that there's so many false failures out there that a larger transformer was necessary um, in HyPot testing. Not only that, but certain features needed to be created to help combat th these false failures uh, due to the characteristics of AC and DC voltages. Um, let's go to the DC, one minute DC voltage test. The DC voltage uh, shall be substantially free of ripple, okay? So again, we see that shall word, shall be free of ripple. So that means when you're buying your HyPod tester, you should be looking at that ripple specification. This requirement is fulfilled if the ratio between the peak value of the voltage and the average value is one plus or minus 3%. Again, everything after that shall is, is more of a guidance. It guides you into what type of tester you should be looking at. Now, again, if you're at a, at a test voltage plus or minus 3%, it's a little more than 3%, right? So, um, you know, looking at some of the specs that we have for our seven, this would be our HyPod Ultra, our 7850 series. Um, we have these all these specs listed out so that um, your you know procurement people or your your quality engineers can look at them and see. Okay, these testers abide by what these standards say. Our DC ripple is uh, four percent, right? Which it's not plus or minus four percent or um, a vague range, but you know, we've designed all our specifications to meet these standards. If we look at our short circuit protection here, 7800, the output, sh which is our 500 VA model, output short circuit current uh, greater than 200 milliamps, right? So we're letting you know, hey, we meet your 500 VA requirements. Uh, let's see here. And here we have a 2% accuracy of 2%, right? Where the standard was saying uh, plus or minus 3% uh, plus five volts. Now, the difference here is we're not saying full scale, right? We're saying, hey, if you're at 100 volts, we'll be at uh, 102 plus five volts, so 107 volts, right? If you're uh, at 1,000 volts, well, we'll be at 1,025, right? Where some of these older models, they'll say, Sure, 2% of 5,000, right? But if you take that value at uh, 100 volt high, you're trying to do, you know, small components, well, now you're doubling your voltage. So um, specifications of your high power tester are very important. The type of language they use, full scale, or is it of setting? Um, you know, those can be the make or breaks on if you should be buying this tester or not. All right, let's go back to our slides here. So let's see what some, we just read this um, directly out of the standard. Um, some of the other standards, uh, a voltage of substantially sine wave form with a frequency of 50 hertz or 60 hertz, and the value specified in uh, table 10.2, which again calls out that 200 milliamp short circuit value. And um, the overcurrent relay shall not trip when the output current is less than 100 milliamps. So again, we're still talking about the same thing. Hey, don't say, so what's the overcurrent relay, right? So overcurrent means that that high pot tester is not protecting itself, right? That transformer uh, doesn't wanna be in a state where it's pushing out more current than it's rated for. And so overcurrent means 
that high power tester is going to shut itself down to protect itself. So that relay should not trip at less than 100 milliamps, which is what a 500 VA tester is. Um, let's see, IEC 60335-1, household appliances. The insulation is subject. Yep, is subjected to a voltage of substantially sinusoidal waveform having a frequency of 50 or 60 hertz for one minute. Again, no breakdown shall occur. Uh, test runs at 4,000 volts or less. Uh, again, you require the 100 milliamps or 200 milliamps short circuit. So we discussed one reason why 500 VA is necessary. Well, there's just highly capacitive products out there that leak more than 5 or 20 milliamps and uh, you need to make sure you have enough juice to not get these false failures. Now, a second reason why a 500 V8 tester uh, has been put into these standards is because of unregulated analog testers. So line versus load regulation. What's that mean? Um, if we're talking about input voltage, well, you know, not everyone around the world uh, has modernized grid systems where we can be fairly confident that throughout an eight-hour shift my voltage from the wall will be 115 volts or 120 volts right uh, it might vary from 100 to 130 and so if I'm high pot testing uh, with one of these old analog meters they're unregulated meaning if my test voltage is a thousand volts right and I get that thousand volts at 115 to 120 uh, input voltage, but if I have some sort of a you know brownout effect or <clears throat> the voltage dips to you know something else being connected on that same grid, well now your voltage can dip down to you know 800 volts. <clears throat> and as I said earlier, if that auditor comes in and you know, is looking at that needle on your old analog meter, he's going to say, you're not, yeah, I understand you're plugged into wall, I understand you're set to 1,000 volts, but you're not outputting 1,000 volts, you're outputting 800, and now you're forced to do all these extra, t all these extra kind of validations or verifications, you know, where you, where you're constantly, now you have to buy a transformer and change the voltage and show me that you're going to be at 1,000 volts at uh, 100 to 130. You know, um, do this uh, every day before a shift. Uh, so that's imp that's line regulation, right? So another issue that comes up is load regulation. So what happens if that insulation you're testing has now, uh, you know, its character due to this thousand volt application has changed? Well, right, Ohm's law. If you change if if you change um, the resistance, well, what's that do, right? It drops down the voltage. And so that's an issue you'd see too with some of these old testers is there was just no load regulation. And again, <clears throat> they would be forced to uh, take a, a variable load and click through all these different voltages and prove that, hey, your, th your thousand volts maintains. And again, because it's an unregulated source or an unregulated high pot tester, well, now you're forced to do this uh, before every shift. And so that's why it's just easier to say, okay, well then let's just tell them, hey, you have to buy a 500 VA tester. Because once you have that much power in your transformer, you lose the fear of these dips happening. If the high pot circuit is too heavily loaded or the input voltage drops, the high pot test voltage can dip, causing an improper high pot test. Now that's due to some of these smaller transformers and these older testers, which just couldn't handle that variance. Now you throw in a huge 500 VA transformer, now the dip um, in input voltage and the change in load won't cause such a drastic change in your output voltage. So that's kind of the other reason why this 500 VA uh, was put into uh, these standards because if you look here, uh, what's a regulated high pot output? Well, whether you're at 100 volts or 130 volts, you know, your associated research high pot tester is going to maintain that thousand volts throughout the test. And uh, 
what's great about it is, well, obviously 500 VA testers, it's more hardware, they're more expensive. But if you tell them, hey, my associated research is a regulated out output, well, now you can buy the 20 milliamp one, right? Now you don't have to do the overkill, uh, just in case you have those, uh, you're in a part of the, the world where, you know, you're prone to, to brownout conditions. Um, so uh, you just have more peace of mind with these regulated uh, high-pot testers that you don't have to worry about the variance when running uh, a high-pot test. How are we doing on time? All right. <clears throat> so here's some more specific language on 500 VA high pot testing and the luminaires standard. If the output of the test equipment is less than 500 VAs, the equipment shall include a voltmeter in the output circuit to directly indicate a test potential, right? So, hey, if you're not buying the 500 VA testers, well then I better, when I come to audit, I better be able to see what the voltage is on that meter because if it dips less than a thousand, well, now I can ding you, right? And as I said, the exception is buy a 500 VA tester. There's so much juice in that tester that you don't have to worry about those dips. Um, leakage current. We've talked about AC versus DC testing. We want to make clear that leakage current is uh, the total of your capacitive leakage and your resistive leakage. So on the left here on this little diagram, you that's your high pot tester. And what we're doing is not only collecting that resistive leakage, the real leakage flowing through your insulation, but also uh, that reactive capacitive leakage. And we total that up. And what's great about um, this screen is often Omnia, where you get multiple meters, right? You get your total current, um, you can see here, at this moment, it's at 2.56 milliamps, but you also get that real current. So now you've identified uh, the characteristics of your product, how much of this leakage is actually real, how much is uh, reactive. Um, does that real part scare me, right? At uh, 0.780 milliamps, um, well, Right, most GFIs are triggered at about 450 microamps or, or 0.5 milliamps because that's about when we can perceive shock as a human. So is it bad? It's all right, right? Where no one's going to get hurt. They'll understand, whoa, there's something happening here, but no one will get hurt. Um, so again, this is the composite leakage. Total current is real plus reactive. So before we get on to some of our next features and how they combat these uh, difficulties with uh, AC characteristics and DC ramping up so quickly. We want to talk about um, two features specifically. When high pot testing, do you utilize your high and low limit parameters? So what are your high and low limit parameters? Well, I would anticipate that some people don't, well, obviously they're self-explanatory by what they say, but right, some people are, might not use them because my standard says breakdown. No breakdown shall occur. I don't, I can't plug in breakdown into the high limit uh, parameter, right? So are you using these high and low limit parameters? So I'll let Brittany open up the poll and then we can uh, discuss the results. So in, in our upcoming slides, we'll talk about if you're not given guidance by the standard, how can you come up with those numbers to input into your high and low limit parameters? Hey, Tony, we've got results. Awesome. 14% said, no, not sure what to set. 29% said, no, I am only looking for breakdown. 36% said, yes, I have a hard set leakage limit. And 21% said, yes, but just for internal data collection. Sure which is um, the point I was gonna get to with some of these results. So we have um, over 40% of people not using their high and low limits, which is fine, right? No one is telling you you have to. Again, standards are the minimum you can do to consider your product safe and to put it on the market and sell it, right? That's the minimum you can do. And if you wanna do the minimum, that's fine. Um, it's, 
I felt like when I said that it sounded judgy. I didn't mean it like that. I'm just saying, right? It, it's it, that's what you're supposed to be testing to. They tell you what to test to, and some people just don't think about it that way. Like, well, that's the minimum we can do. We can do more. Um, and what do I mean by doing more? So it's important to identify a, a profile for your product. Um, if I make <clears throat> you know, uh, some sort of electric fan or something, right? And um, my standard tells me no breakdown shall occur. Great, I have 100 fans, some of them leak one milliamp, some of them leak 10 milliamps, some of them leak five, seven. I'm not breaking down, I can sell them, I'm good, right? But <clears throat> maybe internally, those the I believe 21% that are doing it for internal data, well, they wanna make sure that they're getting any key indicators and changes in their production, right? Especially if you're producing overseas, right? You, it's, it's, it's tough to be monitoring that all the time. So creating these thresholds um, can help identify any changes. So how do we do that? Um, first, perform and record. So, so perform hypo on known good products and record all results. So uh, someone can take 10 good products Hypot them, identify an average leakage that you have, right? If you leak, um, calculate the average leakage current values for those products. Now, <clears throat> take 25% of this number and add this uh, average value. This is your high limit. So, meaning, hey, if I, for the most part, leak five milliamps, all right, I'll set my high limit to 7.5 milliamps. And, um, well, we have examples down here. Um, we'll get to those in a second. And then subtract that same 25% and use it as your low limit. Now that 25% that's arbitrary, that's that's kind of just what we've seen in the field with customers and you need to allow, right? If, if you get leakage between five and seven, well, you're not gonna do 25% of you know six because you might still hit that seven number and get these false failures. So that's that's um you know respective to, to your application and what you see. So that 25% number isn't written in stone or anything. But say I test 10 DUTs and calculate an average leakage current of 5.5 milliamps, my limits would be high limit. 5.5 times a quarter is uh 6.88 milliamps. So now that's what I'm setting in my high limit. I subtract that 1.375 or that 25% and my low limit is now at 4.13 milliamps. Um, if I set my low limit at 4.13 and I fail for low limit at two milliamps, is that bad? It's not bad, right? That's good. Your installation has now somehow improved, but you've now been given an indicator that something's different about this one than all the other ones. Where'd this one come from? Who tested it? Where was it manufactured? Why is it different? Um, right? Maybe that's more important on the other side, right? If, if um, for that 6.8, if you're leaking 10, 12, sure, you're not breaking down, but again, this just gives you insight. You've created a profile for your product and now you have peace of mind that everything you're shipping out the door is, um, you know, there's some uniformity within that product. All right, so next we'll talk about some HIPAA instrument features um, that help with some of the DC issues you run into when dealing with a capacitive product. First, um, smart GFI. Now this is for DC or AC. Our smart GFI, it's, it's like your home GFI. What's the GFI at home, right? There's, there's a, a comparator that makes sure that the same current that's going into your fridge is coming back through the neutral in that um, receptacle, right? And so if there's a difference of, you know, 450 microamps or half a milliamp, it'll trigger and it'll shut off and you have to reset your, or reset your GFI. Right, happens in the bathroom with uh, hair blow dryers. Um, it, it works same here, right? Out of my HV port, I know how much current is coming out. I expect that same amount to come back through my return. Now, if somehow current is leaking to earth ground, usually that's due to 
current going through an operator, shocking them and returning to ground. So now my GFI knows the trip. Um, our trip setting is, for some of our older models, is, is a hard set at 450 microamps. I discussed again why at 450 microamps. That's about when human body can start uh, feeling the sensation of, of shock. It doesn't hurt, but we know something's going on. So hey, why not? As soon as uh, we see 450 microamps, we shut off, and your operator hasn't been hurt. Now, there's exceptions, right? Sometimes you just, your HyPot tester is part of this huge uh, testing um, apparatus that you've created that is just naturally leaky, and you're constantly going to get these false failures because you're leaking more than 450 microamps. And so we've, on some of our newer series, you can, uh, that's adjustable. And Actually, the smart thing about it is that the GFI will turn off if you connect your product to ground. So if you connect the ground of your product to earth ground, well now, all leakage current is coming back through ground to the transformer of your HyPot tester. So there's no need to worry about a, a, a smart GFI failure. So again, smart GFI, that's for the safety of your operators. We have um, an interlock, which um, is called out in some standards, not UL standards or whatnot, but some safety standards. I'm not sure if it's OSHA. I don't think it's OSHA, but there are some safety standards that say, hey, your interlock must uh, be tested to the standard. Um, it doesn't apply too much to high-bot testing, but nonetheless, we have an interlock. Um, the standards don't apply, not an interlock. Interlock is used in most, uh, I would say, in every, you know, application. Uh, it's an interlock is located in the signal input. It's like a, a DB9 pin connector. If pins in 4 and 5 are not shorted, your out your HyPot tester will not output. And this can be used with a, a DUT enclosure, you know, a light curtain. Um, it can be used with some dual palm remotes, which are just, you know, two buttons you press down with your palm. And the only way the test will start is if those uh, buttons are pressed in AKA the interlock is closed. And so the interlock is a great um, way to uh, add safety to your testing procedure. Again, we have uh, our own DUT enclosures and um, dual remote palm switches like I discussed. And it's like a key to your car, right? If you're in charge of making sure the lab is safe and you know there's no HyPod testing that's gonna be happening today, you can take that. We have an, in a little interlock table, a little key. You take it out. You put it somewhere safe, and you know that hypothesis tester will not output without that interlock. Uh, prompt and hold. This is a very convenient feature um, that is used with our interlock sometimes. So prompt and hold means, hey, you know, I haven't, every operator isn't an expert on what we're doing here, but they know, hey, disconnect this and connect it to here. And so our testers have prompts that you can tell to change clips. Now, that gets tough when you have um, a DUT enclosure, right? So, okay, the prompt says, hey, take the black clip and uh, clip it to 0.2 now. Well, what's your operator gonna do is you're gonna open the DUT enclosure, your interlock just opened, you just got an abort signal, you failed your test, now you have to start all over. Um, well, we've created this patented option where it's called uh, prompt interlock, meaning, when a prompt is on, I won't be looking for that interlock signal. So it's real convenient to, for uh, applications where you want to keep your operator safe during the test, but you still need to get into your product to change cables. This is found on our Omnia series. So ramp high and charge low, these are the ones I was alluding to earlier. Again, if I'm performing a DC HyPod test and I have a very short ramp time, well, I'm going to get a large inrush or a spike of reactive current, right? And I'm going to fail immediately. So what ramp high does is it ignores your high limit during the ramp time. And it says, hey, during ramp time, I'll allow you to leak as much as you want because I know it's probably just reactive current. But once that dwell comes, once that voltage has uh, steadied and maintained at your proper testing voltage, now I'm starting to judge, I'm going to judge you again. And if you pass your uh, high limit, or if I see a large inrush, I'm going to call it a breakdown. So that makes sense, right? It, it, 
it helps you from having to create a long ramp up time and delay production. Charge low is, um, is something different. So again, we talk about a low limit, right? That low limit is good for understanding the profile of your product. It's, it usually leaks this much. If it leaks too little, that means something's changed. Well, that change could be that your operator forgot to connect the return clip, right? Because earlier we discussed not properly connecting to your product might damage a hypo tester. It won't. Not connecting, um, or improperly connecting, but not connecting to your product, you're just gonna, it's gonna pass. I'm, I'm, I'm hypo testing air. Air is the ideal insulator, right? So I'm gonna pass all day. So that's why low limit is important because a low limit, I expect to leak at least two milliamps. If I see zero, boom, low limit failure, the operator checks the lead, I forgot to connect the lead, right? That doesn't really work for DC testing because again, once I get that spike of, of reactive current and my voltage steadies, well now my leakage is gonna go down towards zero. And so I can't really use a low limit because I'm expecting a Z zero leakage during a DC hypo test when I'm in the dwell. And so with charge low, and so there's no way to catch that operator forgetting to clip something on. And so what we've created is this charge low feature. So what charge low will do is when it's that, that short ramp up time, I'm gonna measure that spike of current that I'm letting that I'm letting go. I'm not gonna fail you for it. Ramp high lets it go. Hey, I understand it's reactive current. I understand you're not really having a breakdown, you're not failing. So I will only judge you when that dwell time comes. Now charge low will measure that spike and remember that value. And so charge low will take that spike, will take maybe half that value. And now for every subsequent test, I expect to see at least at least half that spike. If I don't see that spike, you've probably forgot to clip onto your uh, one part, right? Either your high voltage or your return, and you'll you'll get a charge low fail. And again, operator knows, oh, I forgot to clip something on. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit over on my time. We have educational resources on our website. Um, feel free to follow this link. You can see uh, a ton of white papers on these same discussions that we perform our webinars on. Um, you can also see uh, old webinars on YouTube, A-R-H-Y-P-O-T. -A -R -H -Y -P -O -T. You'll find webinars from years ago that discuss a whole webinar on 500 VA testing, a whole webinar on how to test solar panels. Um, so it's, it's a great resource. Our next webinar will be on testing the ground circuit. Uh, Wednesday, July 11th. So, <clears throat> ground continuity, ground bond. It's it's the other required test when you have a class three product. Application consulting. So, um, we do consulting now. Where we'll come out to your uh, facility, or we can even create a personalized webinar for you. Um, train your operators on how to properly run your hypo test. We'll set up your instruments to the standard you're testing to. Um, that we have peace of mind that you're testing correctly, your operators are safe, you are abiding by OSHA regulations, and um, if you need to qualify software or your hardware, um, we're here to help. So there's the contact information there. Um, for any other issues or inquiries you have, feel free to contact Brittany Soha at brittany.soha at iconicsusa.com and she'll get everyone squared away. Um, beyond that, um, I want to thank everyone for joining. I hope uh, you found uh, the information helpful, and we look forward to seeing you for the next webinar. So again, this is Anthony signing off. Uh, thank you again for attending.